Today marks the 15 year anniversary of Transformers Animated. The show is remembered for its strong characters, interweaving storylines, and engaging art style. But it's also well remembered for the fact it was prematurely cancelled after its third season. Of course, there were once plans for another, and details have gradually been revealed over the years. However, many of these details remain obscure. You might not know Lugnut, Blitzwing, and Shockwave were planned to defect from Megatron, or that there were ideas for a Twin Peaks-inspired episode about Metalhawk. Today, I plan to bring together everything we know about the fourth season that could have been. Let's take it back to the beginning. The show's core creative team of the late and great art director Derek J. Wyatt, the head writer Marty Eisenberg, and supervising producer Matt Youngberg wrapped in-house production of Season 3 in early summer of 2008. And while the episodes went off to be animated overseas, they fully expected a fourth season renewal in the fall. Of course, no such green light ever came. Almost a year later, by May of 2009, the third season had almost finished airing on Cartoon Network, and they received word that the series would not continue. As unbeknownst to the animated team, Hasbro had entered a TV agreement with the Hub Network for the next Transformers series. Would you be able to confirm a season four of Transformers Animated? I can't, I can't um, confirm or deny right now. Um, uh, the, we're supposed to, Hasbro's supposed to, to say something about it. Um, fairly soon. However, in that year-long wait for a renewal, Hasbro requested some development occur so the ball could get rolling quickly once a green light came. Initially, Marty, Matt, and Derek felt that Megatron and Earth had run their course in the narrative, and pitched a fourth season set largely on Cybertron. Megatron would sit in prison as a Hannibal Lecter-type figure, manipulating the acting Magnus Sentinel into doing his bidding, while the story would shift focus from Decepticons to Predacons, with Black Arachnia serving as the main antagonist. This earlier pitch contained a large different slate of episodes than the later ideas which are widely recognized as the season 4 plans. It was generally Matt Marty and Derek's preferred roadmap of the season. Our feeling, or my feeling in particular, that Megatron was kind of played out. And that to continue to have him be the uber villain and continue to lose would just continue to water him down as any kind of real threat. It, it, it just felt to me, felt really repetitive and not interesting as a character to have him, you know, be this sort of manipulative genius who keeps failing. Originally, we really didn't want him to have as much of a physical presence in the season at all. It probably would have been closer to how he was played in, in season one, where he was very, very limited by what he could do, and then maybe by the end he would have busted out. However, Hasbro denied this request, requiring Megatron and Earth to remain in the forefront to maintain brand synergy with the Michael Bay movies. To take that one step further, Hasbro also wanted Jazz and Ironhide to join the main cast. They also requested Optimus and Megatron get body upgrades, and Minicons join the toy line. The team got to work. Head toy designer Eric Siebenhaler began drafting a Power Master Prime upgrade, which would convert his trailer into armor, and a Triple Changer Marauder Megatron, heavily inspired by Beast Machines and Battle Stars. While Derek was heavily involved in the Megatron, the Optimus was merely an early pass from Eric that Derek didn't get to give notes on. While Eric grinded on the toy front, Derek worked on designs. He drafted an Earth mode for Ironhide, with shield generators on his arms in lieu of his movie counterpart's guns, due to the Autobots' non-militant nature in Animated. An exploratory toy mock-up was in development as well, using Sentinel Primes as a basis, though the actual figure would have been a new mold. At Hasbro's request, Derek also mocked up a revised lineup of the Autobots, more in line with their movie counterparts. Derek's friend Heather Morgan, a contributor to the Allspark Almanac 2, has once again been willing to share details from her many discussions with him. And according to her, Derek found it extremely unlikely that these designs would have ultimately made it into the show. We also know that the creative team publicly disliked the notion of Optimus having this flame paint job. Personally, I wouldn't have wanted to go full on flames with Optimus or change Ratchet to highlighter color or anything. <laughs> so, yeah, that wasn't my choice. Meanwhile, Marty reworked the storyline of the season, which would now focus on Megatron slowly going insane out of desperation and teleporting the prison city of Kaon to Earth in an attempt to convert Earth into a new Cybertron. If we have to bring him back to Earth, which we really didn't want to do in the first place, you know, what's his motivation now? He's, his motivation had always been to conquer Cybertron and, and you know restore Cybertron to its its former Decepticon glory. So why the hell would he go to Earth? Um, and so we just said, well, he goes to Earth because he goes mad. 
you know, just something happens that makes him insane. Um, and that was really the only reason that we could justify him going to Earth and choosing to be a threat on Earth. And I think what we decided was, well, he's going to turn Earth into the new Cybertron. The Minicons would serve as security in Trypticon prison and fall under Megatron's control, Optimus would snatch his Power Master armor from Sentinel in the premiere, and Megatron's new triple changer form would be the final straw in his mental decline. So someone pitched making him a triple changer and then we thought, well maybe there's something in, you know, in the whole triple changer program that makes you go nuts, you know, like, like, like Blitzwing, like it's, it's very unstable preprocessor so that we could justify you know Megatron being this sort of savage killer and I think also there was probably an aspect of maybe making him more like the movie Megatron as, as much as you can discern any kind of characterization from that movie. Marty drafted a new pass of episodes cutting many Predacon centric stories in favor of newly conceived ones designed to showcase Hasbro's requests. But before discussions could occur to solidify the events of the season Hasbro shut down the series. As such, an important thing to keep in mind is that there aren't necessarily Season 4 plans, there are Season 4 ideas. This was a proposed roadmap, but it could have changed at any point due to Hasbro's branded toy needs, Cartoon Network's broadcast needs, or simply the creators having a better idea. I think we went through a, a number of, of iterations of what Season 4 might look like, none of which I got paid for, by the way. It was an evolving thing, I mean, even what I called the final document was still something that was going to be subject to change. You know, I, see, I think season three is a perfect example where we started to do a season a certain way and we got three episodes in and then they put the brakes on and we totally had to, uh, um, you know, rejigger at least the beginning of the season. For example, we all know a season three that looks like this, but the originally proposed roadmap when the season began production may have looked something more like this with four entirely different episodes and the events of our existing season premiere occurring in the finale. Then, a later iteration of this chart featured Devastator as the final threat of the season. Clearly a lot changed, and a lot would have changed with season 4. All of this information was revealed in the Transformers animated AllSpark Almanac 2 from 2010, and later issue 71 of the Transformers Collectors Club magazine from 2016. The episode blurbs from the Almanac were written by author Jim Sorensen, sourced from Marty Eisenberg's documents. Several episodes and details were held back at Marty's request. Years later, the Collectors Club featured episode descriptions straight from Derek J. Wyatt himself, featuring many new episodes and details with graphics from him and his friend Josh Perez. However, when I showed the episodes from the Collector's Club issue to Marty last year, he had this to say. There's some information on there that's just wrong. It just was not in any of the documents. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what your source is. So I think over, over the years, the legend has grown as to what actually was season four. The major difficulty with discussing this hypothetical fourth season is that Marty and Derek tended to have directly contradictory statements. For example, Marty said in 2019 that they never figured out what Sari's origin was going to be, while Derek said this. Everything about Sari, we, we know. We know her past and we know her future. Derek stated in 2019 that Lockdown was a Trypticon prison guard before he became a bounty hunter, a notion that Marty had never heard of when I asked him. Yeah, that wasn't anything that we had specifically planned, but I, I as I kind of leafed through the, uh, through the old documents, I don't recall we had a specific lockdown story. The source for many of these inconsistencies is that Derek never stopped thinking about the show and adding to the story in his head. Josh Perez sat down with my friend Alex and I and discussed Derek's ideas for this universe. Especially when Fun Publications, when we didn't know Fun Pub was gonna stop doing that, Derek and I had ideas. The idea that we get to pitch doing a quote unquote season four. Um, and because of that, Derek's been, he was thinking of a lot of, a lot of ideas after the show had ended that definitely he probably wasn't talking with Marty Eisenberg about because, you know, it's, it's him talking to me and, and a couple of friends while we're watching Food Network or something. It's important to keep in mind that while Marty's statements about a fourth season are always rooted in the strong memory of the discussions and documents from 2009, the mythology of Transformers Animated never stopped expanding in the mind of Derek Wyatt and many of his statements and descriptions from the years beyond the show 
may or may not reflect actual discussions that were had when the show was in production. It's about high time to start talking about the pitched episodes. All of those were stories that were under consideration at one point or another, but I don't believe all of them were under consideration in any one single document. Just remember that every episode we mention was discussed during the show's production, usually during the fourth season discussions, but we don't know if they were on the most recent version of the season 4 document. We'll of course start with The Trial of Megatron, parts 1 to 3. At Hasbro's request, Marty Eisenberg wrote an early treatment for this three-part season premiere. A treatment being a step above a brief premise, and a step below a properly formatted script. This outline sat on Marty's hard drive until the UK-based Transformers convention TF Nation reached out to him in 2019 to do something with it. Marty pulled strings and got the show's voice cast to record the treatment in character. <laughs> Although it was originally convention exclusive, the team at TF Nation was eventually able to publicly and permanently post it online during their online stream in 2021, with newly commissioned art pieces and character models and show backgrounds provided by Jim Sorensen, who casually has every single existing Transformers animated production asset on his hard drive. To tell you everything we know about Trial of Megatron would basically include playing the entire 60 minute special, which I obviously won't do. To give you the briefest rundown, the episode as proposed would have opened with Optimus' team being praised as heroes after their capture of Megatron in the season 3 finale. A funeral is held for Prowl, and after Ultra Magnus' final words are endorsing Optimus as his successor, Sentinel becomes increasingly desperate to prevent Optimus' rise to power at all costs having a Power Master armor created for him, and luring Bumblebee to his side with the promise of elite guard status. A bar fight makes Optimus look heroic and Sentinel look foolish. A Power Master malfunction further damages Sentinel's reputation, while a battle against Team Char on Cybertron's moon boosts Optimus's. Beachcomber, having had his death scene cut from Season 3, would have shown up and immediately died, in a scene that's so irrelevant to the plot it's almost hysterical. Derek really, really wanted Beachcomber to die. <laughs> Sentinel assigns Ironhide to be Prime's bodyguard to keep tabs on him, and during the trial, Rattletrap acts as Megatron's attorney and gets him cleared of all charges. Megatron gravely injures Sentinel and teleports the prison city of Kaon to Earth, on top of Dinobot Island, in pursuit of the new Energon crystals which have sprouted around the city. Optimus gears up in the Power Master suit and his team pursues them, though Bulkhead stays behind on Cybertron. Rattletrap disappears somewhere on Earth, Bumblebee rejoins Prime's side, Megatron sacrifices Shockwave, Lugnut, and Blitzwing into the reactor to power Trypticon, with a reprogrammed army of Minicons following his every command, and the fourth season status quo begins. In the outline, Sari returns to Earth with the Autobots. However, in the season outlines from the Almanac and Collector's Club, Sari remains on Cybertron with Bulkhead. This goes to show just how loose the early discussions of the season storyline were. My understanding is that Sari remaining behind on Cybertron was the more recent and preferred version of the story. The outline features two new characters named Tractor and Uplink. Eric Siebenhiller designed them for TF Nation, without Derek's involvement that we know of. While the outline mentions Obsidian leading Team Char, Marty confessed he may have gotten Obsidian and Stryka confused in that draft, and if that's the case, it would have been corrected later. Derek's description explicitly mentions Stryka rather than Obsidian. In addition, his blurb of Part 1 says that Sari begins auto-boot training with Cup, something that does not happen whatsoever in Marty's outline, and Cup himself not even appearing. The final thing to note is that this was a first draft. Hasbro and Cartoon Network never got the chance to look it over and give notes. Countless details and story points could have and would have changed in a final version. Beyond the trial of Megatron, the episode order differs between the Almanac and the Collector's Club. Josh was willing to shed some light on why this might be. Yeah, I remember um, because when because I, I I was the one that put that laid out the episodes for that for the Fun Pub image. Well, I mean, well, Derek had it down what went where, and then we moved things. I remember moving things uh, around. Uh, maybe not moving things around, but I remember Derek mentioning that he moved things around. Because uh, when it comes to Derek, I feel like if Mar if if Marty showed him the episode list and said this is the episode list, I feel I feel like Derek would just be like. Let's put this episode here and that episode there. Let's just switch them. Like, I feel like Derek would want to do that because Derek, in, in a lot of the stuff that he works on, he also, he very much has story ideas as well. Um, and I think a lot of it is him maybe, it, it's either him having a different version than Marty that maybe it was like a later updated version 
or maybe Derek's version could have been out of date too. But the way that things spill into each other, I feel like Derek's might have been a more recent version. Going with Derek's account, the next episode was to be Turf War. The Almanac's description reads, an explosive turf war is waged between the Constructicons and the Decepticons for control of Detroit's Energon. While Derek's description says, the Autobots find themselves in the midst of an explosive turf war, when Dirt Boss and the Constructicons discover a new way of becoming the big bots of Detroit and gain control of this powerful new energy source known as Energon. Marty clarified that beyond Trial of Megatron, there isn't much more information about these episodes than was publicly available. The Almanac and Collectors Club might have one paragraph about an episode, and their internal documents maybe had two or three. Derek's description clearly leans more heavily into the coming of Devastator, including an old sketch of his head dating back to the show's production, which Josh colored for this magazine. We know for sure that Derek wanted more Constructicons in the show. So how many pilots would have been in the Death Stag? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. We didn't, we didn't quite get that far working it out. There was, um, we're definitely going to add at least two more Constructicons. He stated on multiple accounts that they wanted two more Constructicons, but never decided which two they would be. In 2021, he posted a sketch of Bone Crusher's head, though it's not clear if this was an older or more recent piece. However, according to Eric and Marty on multiple accounts, it's unlikely that this would have occurred due to Hasbro's resistance to produce a combiner toy for animated. Making a toy that, you know, we knew was going to be a, a $50, $60 toy was not something that they wanted to commit to at that time. Yeah, there were, I think there were a few decisions that sort of got mixed economically, but we still kind of pushed them story-wise, just mm. in case. Yeah. Like, we were, we were planning to do a combiner yeah. with the Constructicons, yeah. and we always left room for it, um, but, but ultimately it just was going to be too expensive yeah. to do. Well, yeah, and it was, it was always in flux because of whether or not we could do Devastator or some limited version of, of Devastator. We, we didn't want to get too far down the road with it just to have them say, no, we're not, we can't do it. What does remain universally consistent across all accounts, though, is that Bulkhead was planned to be an unwilling centerpiece of Devastator. The idea was that Bulkhead was an unwilling part of Devastator. Dirt Boss and the other two Constructicons, plus Bulkhead, made Devastator. And then there was sort of a, a secondary element that was part of Devastator unwillingly. Someone had come up with a sketch, it might have been Eric, um, had come up with a sketch of, of how to incorporate um, the two Constructicons, Dirt Boss, and Bulkhead into something like Devastator, mm -hmm. but not quite as elaborate. Um, the only thing I really remember about Turf War, I think it's like, like it's all public knowledge now, is that it, the combiner was going to be, uh, the, it was going to be the three Constructicons from the show, and then they were going to have Bulkhead be the main bulk of the body. But that's that's really all I remember him divulging. I should bug I should bug Eric and see if maybe if maybe he has that somewhere. Currently, Eric Siebenhiller's mock-up of Bulkhead, Scrapper, Mixmaster, and Dirt Boss forming a four-bot Devastator has not been publicly released. Though this condensed form was quite possibly the only way he would have made it into the series. Is it entirely possible that had the show got a fourth season, it still could have gone and went without Devastator appearing? Probably. I, I think that is a likely scenario. A very common misconception is that Skipjack was going to be a part of Devastator. However, this is not the case. TFA Skipjack was a recolor of a Rector, a joke character introduced in the Yellspark Almanac addendum in 2011, based on a G1 Micromaster of the same name. This image, commonly misattributed to the Yellspark Almanac, is from issue 59 of the Transformers Collectors Club. The gag here is that Jim Sorensen's pitching to Derek and Marty that a seven foot tall Micromaster should form the entire lower half of Devastator, to which Derek jokingly replies that he could only be a toe at best. This is clearly a pretend conversation, so I don't know if Derek was actually involved in this issue whatsoever. In addition, up until 2010, the notion of a Constructicon named Skipjack simply didn't exist. Just to clarify, he was called Rampage for the first year after Revenge of the Fallen, but after people started wondering why he was simultaneously red and yellow, Hasbro retroactively decided the yellow one was Skipjack in 2010. Skipjack being a pre-production name that was accidentally left in the credits despite the fact that he is called Rampage within the actual film itself. There's a lot of lore there. Skipjack was later given a little design revision and placed in 2015's complete Allspark Almanac with a little bio to boot. Many people mistake this bio for season 4 plans. That's not the case. 
Dirt Boss would not have used Constructicon CNA in Transformers Animated because CNA wasn't introduced until the next show, Transformers Prime. Derek didn't even remember this character in 2019. Skipjack would not have shown up in the show in any capacity. We also know that Derek really wanted the Dinobots to fight Devastator, though we don't know if that would have been in this episode, or if it would have happened at all. Also, were there any uh, plans to further round out the Dinobots or the Constructicons? Yes, for both. Yeah, and then they would fight to the death. <laughs> we wanted to do Devastator first, you know, uh, and, and then finish the, the Dinobots and have them go to war. Will we have seen any more Dinobots in Season 4? Possibly. Um, we talked about that in the TV. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's right. We had plans to hopefully finally finish off the Construct Pounds and do Devastator. Yeah. And then finish the other, doing the other Dinobots. So those, I, think I wanted to have six Dinobots total. So I wanted, and then I wanted them to fight to the death. So what would those Dinobots have been then? Well, with the Sludge and the other Snarl and then uh, uh, a Velocity. Velociraptor type, honorable, you know, Dinobot. Yeah, Dinobot. Over the last several months, I've commissioned 20 pieces from professional artists depicting the events of these episodes that might have been. This one, from Derek Wyatt's friend, comic book artist Josh Burcham, showcases a battle between Megatron and a Derek-inspired multi-constructicon Devastator in an inner John infested Detroit, Devastator having been designed by Alex. This is Why I Hate Organics is an episode concept first formally revealed by Derek in 2016. After his brief appearance in This Is Why I Hate Machines, Marty Eisenberg fell in love with the slimy character of Rattletrap, giving him that substantial role in Trial of Megatron. This story would have picked up after his disappearance at that story's end, with the description reading, Rattletrap finds himself on Earth, surrounded by nothing but eek, organics. He manages to scan in Earth vehicle mode, but quickly finds himself the target of both the Autobots and Decepticons. Derek actually alluded to this episode back at TFCon 2010. Were there any plans of turning Rattletrap into an actual Maximum? <laughs> uh, we're gonna bring him to Earth first and have him get in Earth mode. And we wanted to do like a uh, like the Denny Roth kind of hot rod car with you know pipes and we oh yeah, we wanted to put up like a rat uh, logo on the side of his car. <laughs> and, and then it, maybe I think it was leading down that path. Uh, this piece from the artist Nighttime depicts Rattletrap on the run, as threats from all sides hunt him down. Nighttime also designed his Earth mode in this piece as well. Freddie Fazbear's actual official voice actor thought it was good. Thanks, Callan. Next is Mirror Mirror. The Almanax Blur breeds, a routine trip to Earth becomes an exercise in shattered preconceptions, when Bulkhead and Zari find themselves in a universe inhabited by heroic Decepticons and evil Autobots. Derek's blurb says, Bulkhead and Sari attempt to transwarp back to Earth to rejoin their friends, but end up in a mirror universe where Autobots are evil and Decepticons are good. An interesting discrepancy is that Jim's account reads as though Bulkhead and Sari are visiting Earth for one episode, whereas Derek's account makes it seem like they're permanently returning. The concept of Transformers Shattered Glass was introduced in 2008 at the Transformers convention BotCon, and it stuck in the minds of Marty and especially Derek, who opted to introduce the concept into their series with Mirror Mirror, named after the classic Star Trek story of the same name. Mirror Mirror was originally pitched for Season 3, but was cut from the lineup when Cartoon Network requested a three-part season premiere. As such, a Season 3 version of the episode exists in treatment form like Trial of Megatron, but it's never publicly been released. Over the years, Derek and Josh colored Shattered Glass depictions of almost every character from the series. I already made an entire video archiving these in detail, which you can view here. That'll cut 20 minutes out of this one. Derek has also produced countless art pieces of Shattered Glass Sorry over the years, and Heather was willing to recount various ideas he had for her around 2010 and 2011 including an army of sparkplug hounds patrolling Sumdax Detroit, Tudorbot emotionally brainwashing Sari, Shattered Glass Sari building her own version of Bumblebee after seeing Sari's bond with her own Bumblebee, and evil Sumdax keeping Sari's mother locked away in a cage to keep her in line, causing Sari to be emotionally attached to a mother she barely knows. Now, keep in mind that Derek had all of these ideas years after the show's production. Had the show aired a fourth season as intended back in 2010, it's unlikely that these concepts would have been featured. According to Heather, although she hasn't seen the outline of Season 3's Mirror Mirror, Derek mentioned that Shattered Glass Sari was barely featured in it and not very developed, with this tiny JPEG being the only visual development of Shattered Glass from the show's actual production. Derek also imagined Sumdak Tower fused with the G.I. Joe Terror Drome in this Shattered Glass universe. 
I made a couple mock-ups of what this might look like and Heather thought this was closest to what Derek was probably imagining, though sadly we'll never know for sure what he envisioned. This piece by Oreo Glitch showcases a long-awaited battle between Sari and her Shattered Glass counterpart in the burning halls of Sumnak Tower. She got carried away with this concept, also showcasing the evil Autobots from Derek's designs taking orders from evil Sumdak and rendering one final piece depicting Sari and Bulkhead standing triumphantly alongside the heroic Decepticon fighters. Josh Perez finalized a color scheme for Shattered Glass Blitzwing, based on a cheap knockoff toy that Derek stated he would take his inspiration all the way back in 2009. Gremlins in the Gears is the episode that would have finally showcased Hasbro's Minicons, with the Almanac's description reading, The Minicons who run Kaon escape into Detroit and begin to disassemble all machinery in their path. Even Autobots, Ratchet and Fanzone have their hands full trying to contain the chaos. The Collector's Club description reads, Minicons are loose and causing all kinds of havoc in Detroit, sabotaging and disassembling all machinery they come across, including the Autobots. The episode's premise seems to be heavily inspired by the Gremlins movies, the same way Decepticon Air is an homage to Con Air. We know from the trial of Megatron that Megatron would have assumed full control of the Minicons at that story's end, it's presently unclear if Megatron would somehow be behind the Minicon Rampage. Derek designed his take on the Kaon Minicons in 2011, and actually requested that BotCon include them in their Stunticon job comic. They are Highwire, Grinder, SureShock, and Leader One, based directly on their Transformers Armada counterparts, Ducky, not based on any pre-existing Transformer, but on Wally, -E, and Reach Out is actually based on Armada Longarm, but since a character in Transformers Animated already has the name Longarm, he was named after a 2010 toy called Reach Out, who was remolded from Cybertron Longarm. The Reach Out after which this one was named did not exist when the show was actually in production three years prior, so it's unlikely he would have had this name. In addition, Hasbro may have had specific toy needs that could have altered their designs drastically, such as needing them to transform. Eric's Power Master Prime mock-up includes a Minicon that clearly takes a different approach than Derek would take three years later. Derek designed the Minicons we know today with 100% creative control, which is something he didn't always have during the show's real production. The, the one with the Minicons... I just remembered that all I really remember us talking about was just how, I guess, how goofy the mini the mini cons are going to be. They were going to be very bumbling, very because they're distressed. That there's um, so, oh. when I said they're distressed, it I, I something clicked in my brain, and now it just it, it, it's like flipping on a fuse and then it knocking out again. So they're working for Megatron at the end of Trial of Megatron. Do you know at all if he was going to dispatch them across the city or if they just kind of went uh, rampaging on their own? The, that's the thing that's like, click, that's that's the fuse that's that's knocking off and on is the re reason why the Minicons, uh, like what they're doing specifically. It, it's like a, an echo in my brain that's not being too loud right now. Um, it's gone, I guess, Man. but... <laughs> This piece, once again by Oreo Glitch, showcases Ironhide getting ripped apart by the rampaging Minicons below Detroit, while this one features Ratchet and Fanzone making one dramatic final stand to fight the Minicons off. These are definitely totally inconsistent with what Derek and Josh described, but these were done months before that interview, and I think they look cool. What a Tangled Web We Weave is an episode premise revealed in the Transformers Collectors Club issue in which we learn how Black Arachnia fell in with the Decepticons in the past, how she was responsible for Blitzwing's triple changer mode, and how she adds to her Decepticons in the present. Um, I remember, because, I mean, I think it's common knowledge that Black Arachnia would have been the one to perform the triple changer surgery on Megatron. Um, and I think that's where we start seeing the seeds of that, I think. Because I know, I know me and Derek talked about that one, and, like, I think, you know, like, the something about like i don't know maybe at the end of the i don't know at some point megatron gets his he, he basically gets black arachnia to to the to do triple uh changer uh, upgrade surgery whatever you want to call it on him um and then it would that would start causing him to go insane uh, because you know he's a it's, it's a triple changer and most most people that have that technology put on them it's it's a lot of stress on their mind and I think it, that's where he starts. That's like the seeds of like, I guess him going him being more berserker, I guess, more, more aggressive. Black Arachnia ends up playing a bigger role um, in 
in Transformers with Megatron specifically um, because of that, because she has all this knowledge on, on these upgrades. When I asked Marty, a fan submitted a question of, would this have been a Decepticon-only episode? He responded, Um, yeah, I mean, Tangled Web may have ended up being a Decepticon-only episode. I, I think in general, um, they always wanted to see at least a little bit of Autobot presence, even if even if it was a, a Decepticon-themed um, episode. So I, I don't know. I really, a lot of these questions could only be answered once we got the green light and once we had meetings with freelance writers and beat out the stories in more detail. On that note, Marty says he has no clue if the Beast Wars inspired locale from the end of Predacons Rising would have returned because no discussions were had about its future. The same can be said about which Predacons would have been in Black Arachnia's army. No decisions were ever made because these episodes were never written. Marty's also expressed he's not certain that they would have been allowed to do a Predacon army because Hasbro was extremely resistant to producing Beast characters back in 2009. I also asked Marty another question at the audience's request, which is would Black Arachnia and Waspinator have reverted back to their non-techno-organic forms by the end of the series? Probably not. Um, didn't have specific plans for, for how we wanted them to end up, but uh, I, I liked the idea of this, uh, of Black Arachnia assembling this this techno organic faction that would challenge um, Megatron um, and you know, sort of complicate things for the for the Autobots as well. Um, so I, th I think I probably would have kept them in those forms. A misconception is that Inferno, Antagony, as well as this gold colored Black Arachnia were planned for inclusion in a fourth season. In reality, this isn't the case. Botcon liked to create Redicos of pre-existing Transformers figures. In 2011, they focused on Animated, and had a tie-in story written by Marty Eisenberg called The Stunticon Job. By 2015, another story was planned which would have followed Black Arachnia in the depths of Cybertron. A page was included in the Allspark Almanac to promote the story, but this all fell through when Hasbro retracted Botcon's license in 2016. These were intended to be Botcon recolors, and weren't conceived until many years after the show wrapped production. This being the reason they straight up have Waspinator's body. In addition, the original Antagony was a Botcon exclusive to begin with, with the hope being that an animated Antagony would pay homage to the convention's original. Given the circumstances, it seems highly unlikely that Antagony would have been considered as a candidate to be a Predacon during the show's production, before Botcon began producing TFA recolors. On this note, while we're here, the Botcon stories, the Stunticon job, and the return of Blur were never ever going to be episodes of Transformers Animated. They were specifically created to be script readings. There were story points determined by the attending voice actors and the toys that Botcon wanted to make. There were no plans whatsoever for Blur to be revived within the series. I, I don't know that, I mean, when we were planning out the season four, that never happened. I don't, I don't know that we had any plans. To, he didn't come up. To show him To up. bring him back. Yeah. He didn't come up. This art piece from Chromatroid, expanded from Derek's, showcases Blitzwing trapped precariously in a web as his life is about to be irreparably altered. We're reaching a point where we're going to exceed 13 episodes. Indeed, this list would have been cut down to 13 and among the most likely to go would have been Steam. You know, as the, as the document um, evolved, certain stories got, got taken out. The Flash Forward, Truck vs. Monkey, Steam came from Cybertron. Those were all ones that I think we had pitched in season three as well. So those, I think those were the first ones to get yanked when we had to develop other stories to conform with the uh, um, the concept that Hasbro gave us. The Ulspark Almanac Blur breeds, the radical Luddites of Save the Earth and Mankind run afoul of Soundwave with their steampunk tools and anti-technological agenda. Now the Autobots have no choice but to save their most vocal detractors. Derek's account from the Transformers Collectors Club reads, A group of technophobe vigilantes who believe Sumdac's robot revolution and the coming of the Autobots spells the end for humanity fight back with steam-driven clockwork tech. In the original production bible for Transformers Animated, Marty Eisenberg spent several pages spitballing ideas for human villains when the show was being conceived as more of a superhero story than a traditional Transformers story. Steam was actually among the very first villains brainstormed for the series. Described as Wild Wild West meets Steam Boy, actor Charlton Heston acted as inspiration for the group's leader, G.B. Redmond. You have not yet obeyed the Lord. 
Let my people go. Had the group made it into the show, plenty could have changed. For example, Prometheus Black and Meltdown were initially conceived as two separate villains, Meltdown being an assassin for hire alongside Colossus, Rhodes, and Stiletto. So, the production bible was a springboard for ideas rather than a final product. The production team discussed bringing Steam into the fold into the third and then into the fourth season with this showcase episode of the same name. Derek stated in the past he really wanted Soundwave to reunite with Megatron eventually, and he wanted more cassettes to enter the story. This episode seems like it would have been the most prime candidate for those to happen. This art piece from IDW comic book artist Josh Burcham showcases a battle between Steam and Soundwave, featuring designs from Alex Cabrera. It came from Cybertron. It's an episode that was pitched in Season 2, 3, and 4, failing to make the cut every time. The Almanac blurb reads, Cosmos comes to Earth with an important message for Optimus Prime. After scanning a flying saucer prop from a B-movie set, he loses his memory in an accident. Polarity ensues. Derek's description is very similar. An Autobot with an important message for Optimus comes to Earth, scans a flying saucer from a cheesy B-movie set, then suffers a memory loss and comes to believe he is an alien invader. Hilarity ensues. <laughs> Much like Steam, this was cut as of Marty's most recent version of the document. This art piece by Oreo Glitch showcases the Autobots hot on the trail of this mysterious extraterrestrial invader. On the subject of episodes which may not have made the cut, let's cover several which weren't showcased by either the Almanac or Collector's Club, but were mentioned over the years by Derek. Starting with Truck vs. Monkey. Oh, uh, okay, so Optimus Prime, we were gonna have the uh, Black Racky experiment that was a, a clone of Optimus Prime that kind of went wrong and and oh uh, so uh, Marty Marty reminded me the episode name was supposed to be Truck vs Monkey. Marty clarified that this was pitched for Season 3, but wasn't necessarily considered for Season 4, thus explaining why neither the Almanac nor the Collector's Club issue featured it. This art piece by Sean Montague features Black Arachnia unveiling her new experiment, Optimus Primal, with a character designed by Alex featuring a head pulled from Derek's 90s fan art. Next is Bumble Prime. The Elspark Almanac 2 alludes to an episode cut from Season 3 that would have taken the cast to the future, where Galvatron and his Decepticons are allies of the Autobots in their fight against the vicious Predacons. According to Marty, this was called Bumble Prime. I believe the title was Bumble Prime. I mean, that, that was just something that came from Derek. I think he even had a sketch of what Bumblebee would look like as a, as a Prime. Heather remembers seeing the drawing as well, recalling it was patched together on various sticky notes, but she was unable to find a copy of it. It currently remains lost. We also know from a book citing in 2010 that Sari's future self was intended to have a slight redesign in this story. No, was, was Sari due to, for any more uh, transformation or evolution? Uh, I don't think she was going to have any more physical transformation. The only thing I can think of is, I think we did talk a little bit about if we did that flash forward episode, maybe she was a little bit different. Than that. Oh, right. But not. Right. Josh Perez created this art piece of Bumble Prime and Future Sorry fighting side by side, both designed by Alex. Derek often based TFA designs on existing toys. For example, Botcon 2006's Rat Trap, a Ritiko of Cybertron Ransack, served as direct inspiration for TFA Rattletrap. As such, Alex opted to base Bumble Prime's design on the 2007 Universe Classics Bumblebee figure, a toy Derek had already used as inspiration once before when he based Shattered Glass Bumblebee's color scheme on a Botcon Ritiko called Bug Bite. Alex proposed multiple color variations, and Perez thought Derek would have preferred the gold bug colors. We also know this episode would have involved a new human supervillain called the Time Trucker. We had always wanted to do uh, a time travel episode, and it goes back to even season one, where a number of characters were developed because they were named after Hasbro executives. So Angry Archer Angry was Archer. Aaron Archer, uh, Slomo was Samantha Lomo, um, and we had one for Steve Drucker, who for some reason they were calling the Time Trucker. Um, and so we were, we constantly were trying to find, well, what's the Time Trucker episode? And, and um, we may have even pitched it for season three. Um, it was, it was one of those ideas that would always get, you know, kicked down the road. Uh, but that was, that was the idea of bringing in the Time Trucker to do this flash forward episode. Derek was particularly passionate about this one when he spoke about it during TFCon 2010, which is why Josh Perez volunteered to artistically fulfill his vision. We were, we were going to do, um, a flash forward episode where you just get thrown in into the future and 
Today we're going to talk about it being post Unicron Wars. Galvatron was, was ruler of Cybertron. And I had this mental image in my head of Cybertron having like a, a third of it, of it is gone. And he's sitting on a throne in the center of Cybertron. And he, he rules Cybertron at that point in the future after the Unicron Wars. <laughs> Which we would have skipped. All of that would have been skipped. <laughs> That we were just kind of kind of go around the whole Unicron thing. You'd, uh, his head probably would have been floating around Cybertron, but we didn't want to repeat the movie or try to outdo the movie. In 2014, Derek unveiled his Galvatron design, colored by Josh. Later in 2020, Derek revised and improved a Unicron head sketch from an old 2010 convention commission. Josh featured both of these in his pieces. Let's see, that's the one thing I like about the, um, like I said, that, that the, the books that we've done, Geek Spark and it was like a Japanese, just a TFA fanzine. But the Geek Spark one was Derek showing a lot of what he wanted to do in the series. The Galvatron would have been the Galvatron he introduced in the series. So that design is, while it's not canon, that would have been Galvatron's design. Heather also clarified that Derek was inspired by the Gobot homeworld of Gobatron with his mental image of the ruined Cybertron. He mentioned his dream cast for Unicron and Galvatron as Maurice LaMarche and Zachary Quinto, respectively. Bumble Prime was most likely cut from the Season 3 lineup when Human Error was expanded to a two-parter. It was added to the Season 4 roster during the initial Black Arachnia pitch for the season, but was cut when Hasbro wanted to move away from Predacons in the more recent version of the Season 4 documents. Next up is an episode spoken about by Derek, which may have focused on Metalhawk, Agent Simmons, and Sector 7. At Auto Assembly 2010, Derek spoke about plans for Agent Simmons and Sector 7 in the show. Um, we had, actually we had plans for, for new human characters in, in Season 4. We were going to do a uh, Sector 7 type agency, and we'd have a specific agent who was a relative of some cameo characters we had in the show. I reached out to him on Twitter in 2021, and he actually provided me with a developmental sketch of Simmons. This was sketched alongside Czar, who appeared in Season 3, which provides tangible evidence that discussions of Simmons did date back to the show's production. I didn't ask for much elaboration then, but Josh was willing to reveal a lot more of Derek's ideas now. Metalhawk being a pretender was something he wanted to do in the series. He wanted uh, Metalhawk um, to be like, because uh, you know, he was talking about Sector 7. And um, and the, he wanted them to have a Twin Peaks vibe, and um, Metal Hawk would have been completely Twin Peaks vibe, and he would have had like you know a tuxedo. There's a picture of him in the Geek Spark manga, not manga, the Geek Spark uh, 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 fanzine, where it's like you see the Pretender shell, Metal Hawk, and uh, you see him in like a human form, where he has like a black suit, basically like the men like. I think he was going to, his mind, Sector 7 was going to be more along the lines of like the men in black in a sense. And I, I forget who it was, but he was going to bring someone to voice Metal Hawk specifically. It's been a while since I've seen Twin Peaks, so I don't remember any of the characters, but the ma that main dude that we follow, I think that's who he was thinking of. It would be like some of like a lot of the other voices, like not, not a recurring role, so that way they could, you know, put the budget towards the guest star or something. I don't, I don't know how that works. Yep. Does this whole Metal Hawk thing date back to like the show's production as well? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Um, um, it felt, a lot of it felt like it was fleshed out during the show before they realized they weren't gonna get a season four. Do you, did he ever mention which episode this Metal Hawk Simmons Sector 7 stuff might've plugged into? He was talking about it like it would have been his, its own episode. I don't think it would have, I don't think it's, I don't think it would have popped up. It's just like if they got a season four, um, I think it probably would have been a cut episode of the list that they have, it, but it seems like it was something that he wanted to do. Um, I want to say I remember him saying that he wanted to put these characters in um, an earlier season, uh, Simmons or Metalhawk. He wanted them to be in an earlier season, but um, which makes me think that he's had like he's had this Metalhawk character specifically uh, going on for quite some time in his mind. Probably said, I mean, probably. At least, at least early on in the in the show, yeah, I think he, I know for sure he said he wanted to 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 introduce him having a slice of pie at a diner. Yeah, I knew that he was going to be like kind of quirky. He was going to be a little, you know, like he was going to be a little bit like uh, I, I, I hate to say Twin Peaks, but Twin Peaks, you know, very much. Uh, 
the guy that the guy that did Twin Peaks is um, uh, David Lynch. Lynch. David Lynch. Yeah, yeah, David Lynch. Um, they, he was supposed to have a very strong David Lynch vibe to him, but um, all we we talked about the personality and um, that he would still be a pretender, and that was going to be like a reveal at some point. Um, but <laughs> that's pretty much all I remember. Hopping back to the Collectors Club. We reach the brilliantly titled Triple Threat. In his new Triple Changer mode, Megatron proceeds to ruthlessly obtain Energon. Unfortunately, the Triple Changer mode has given Megatron a bit of an unstable personality to match. A one-bot army blowing away anything and anyone in his path. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's where that's definitely gotta be where where we start seeing that big culmination of people realizing that they need to work together to stop him. As he gets upgraded, he starts going crazy, and everyone realizes how big a threat he is now. Uh, I mean, he's always been a threat, but now he's got, you know, massive firepower. He's got all these capabilities, and it just becomes this thing where, all right, we, we got to stop him now. And then that, pretty much everyone starts joining in for that. Yeah, they turn him into a Dragon Ball Z character in strength. <laughs> <laughs> in addition, Marty explained plans for a Lugnut, Blitzwing, and Shockwave to turn on Megatron in the season as well. A possible response to being hurtled into Trypticon's reactor during the season opening. While he didn't specify that the events he was referring to would have plugged into Triple Threat, I'm including them here out of conjecture due to them closely matching what Josh just described. Um, I think the plan was to bring them back somehow. Um because I think the idea was that they were going to be um, a, a, a sort of a, a, a splinter faction that was going after Megatron because they weren't too happy about how he treated them. Um, so I think the plan was to, to have Starscream recruit them. To address why Marty mentioned Starscream as being alive, there was a deleted scene in Endgame Part 2 which would have seen female Starscream resurrect him. Marty said this was cut from the episode when it started becoming clear to the team that a fourth season may not be coming, though it would have been added back had that fourth season eventually come. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I think it's necessary. This piece from Catsy showcases the Autobots and Decepticons joining forces and charging into battle against a common threat, Marauder Megatron. Derek stated before that he wouldn't have colored Marauder Megatron gray like most fan art, and may have gone for a Beast Machines inspired look instead. Josh, being Derek's primary colorist, took it upon himself to carry out Derek's vision for this video, proposing several iterations before settling on this. Derek similarly was never too fond of Eric C. Benaylor's proposed mock-up of Power Master Prime, but never got the chance to offer his input or alternate ideas before the team formally disbanded. Although he never got around to designing a full Power Master armor, he did get to render his take of a head which is heavily rooted in God Jinrai from the Japanese exclusive show Super God Master Force. Eric was thinking from the perspective of an engineer, wondering how he could take Prime's existing trailer and turn it into armor. Derek was thinking from the perspective of a fan, wondering how he could adapt previous incarnations of Power Master Optimus. Given that much of Derek's 90s fan art looks remarkably similar to the sketches he did for TFA, Alex took Derek's 90s Power Master Prime fan art as inspiration to complete a DJW-inspired Power Master Prime with input from Josh. The artist Nighttime also helped render this two-thirds view. Next up, Allspark Ellipse Now. His description reads, Sentinel travels to Earth, determined to use the Allspark to defeat Megatron. The Ghost of Prowl must inhabit the bodies of Cybertronians powered by Allspark fragments to warn Optimus of the potentially dire consequences of Sentinel's actions. Derek's description says, A spirit from the past uses Allspark fragments as a way of communication from beyond the well of Allsparks, where all are one. I think that's tying in with um, Sentinel doing uh, some shady things, but I can't remember specifically what it was, because now it's like... This, the discussion is rattling pieces of, uh, of memories now, and I, that one specifically is making a deal with someone for something. Our facial expressions freak out. It's just the <laughs> slightest, <laughs> least significant pieces of information. This piece from comic book cover artist Jar of Loose Screws depicts a Prowl-possessed Mixmaster revealing himself to Jazz and Ironhide, while this one depicts Power Master Prime and Prowl-possessed Rekgar rushing to stop Sentinel from making his dire mistake. The designs of Prowl-possessed Allspark Fragment characters come from me. 
I just realized like two months later on video release day, the 26th, that we forgot to give Sentinel his season four shoulder pads and cape that Derek wanted. Just pretend he has these. The next proposed episode is Process of Elimination, unveiled by Derek and the Collector's Club. Bumblebee investigates a series of deadly attacks on his old boot camp platoon, including Ironhide, Bulkhead, Sentinel, and Bumblebee himself, who are being picked off by a mysterious assailant. All signs point to Waspinator or possibly Shockwave, but when they are also attacked, the mystery deepens. Yeah, um, I, re I, that's, I think that's pretty much what I, that's all I remember right now is I do remember that that in that episode that Cliffjumper was gonna have a virus in him. Um, I, I want to say, I want to say, I don't, I can't, I don't know if it was part of the episode or if it was a joke that Derek might have made about Mirage having the virus in him. And Cliff Chimper being suspicious of Mirage because of G, you know the whole G one thing, um, but I feel like the virus was. I feel like he said the virus was in Cliff Jumper. Ah oh, man, there was something about that virus too, and it sucks because it's on the tip of my tongue. I remember it was something I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, and now I don't. Now it's gone. What Josh did remember, though, retroactively, is that Cosmos's message, and it came from Cybertron, was according to Derek. Warning about the events of process of elimination. That's the one where, where he's got a message. He can't remember what that message is. And I want to say maybe... I want to say maybe that's something to do with the whole traitor thing that's going on. Something to do with uh, the, the whole cliff jumper thing, the virus thing. I don't know. I don't know if that's... If I'm misremembering the order, but I think that one's before the cliff jumper one, right? Or is it after? I think that's before. Because um, if it's before, oh. then that's... Then that, if it's a fourth, then that's where it, that, that, that's, yeah. that might be the one that leads up. If it's not before, then I'm missing the reference. No, that is, you were right. That was before. Of course, this Cosmos episode was originally pitched back in season two, three, and earlier versions of season four without process of elimination. So we don't know what his message may have been in those iterations, or if Cosmos' message being about process of elimination was an idea that did it back to the show's production. This piece by Inzimus Prime showcases Bumblebee sprinting for his life across Cybertron, flanked by shadows with dangerous intent. Now, we've finally reached the proposed finale of Transformers Animated's fourth season. Megatron must be destroyed. The AllSpark Almanac's description reads, In the two-part season finale, Megatron's machinations threaten all life on the planet. Optimus must gather as many allies as he can to finally defeat Megatron once and for all. Derek's account is a lot more specific, per usual, with Part 1 saying, As Megatron's plan to reformat the Earth into the new Decepticon homeworld reaches fruition, unholy alliances rise between the Autobots, female Starscream's Decepticons, Black Arachnia's Predacons, and the Dinobots to take him out. Many casualties abound. Part 2 reads, Power Master Optimus battles Megatron. Sari discovers a deeper connection between herself and someone familiar that may save the Earth and Cybertron. At TF Nation 2019, Marty was asked directly who female Starscream's Decepticons may have been, and he didn't have an answer. However, during my call with him in 2021, we were able to piece it together. So the description for Megatron Must Be Destroyed mentions Slipstream having a team of Decepticons. Why was she assembling a team? And I'm gonna guess it's Lugnut, Blitzwing, Shockwave to kind of take down Megatron with Starscream? Yeah, but I think um, it, it wasn't female. Starscream, who was in charge, or uh, I, I looked at my description for it, and it, it said Starscream. Oh, so. interesting, because this is from Derek, and it says uh, female Starscreams, Decepticons. And maybe that was his. He had it in mind that maybe she was more the power behind the throne, and she she was calling the shots. Uh, I don't know. We hadn't um, we hadn't developed it. Okay. You know, the details of it. So, I mean, if that's what Derek wanted, that's probably what would have happened. There's still many lingering questions such as who the casualties may have been and what Sari's revelation was. A lot of the stuff Derek and I talked about with Animated, I feel like he very he was very careful because I mean we were good friends, but I think he was very careful with what he said because I like I don't know anything about Sari. Um well about Sari's or you know the any reveals or origins or anything like that. Um uh, he kept a lot of those uh close jesting and he would tell me specifically just in case he got a chance to do something with these he didn't want people to know too much i i don't remember i don't remember the casualties uh of who they were um 
I'm pretty I'm pretty sure like we'd probably see a lot of Decepticons fall specific ones. Uh, I feel like I remember him joking that because we didn't see Beachcomber die in season three, we would have seen Beachcomber die in this episode. That one I don't remember too much of because those were using I think that was Derek's Marauder Megatronic colored. Um, and we just basically use that for the thumbnails. And I think because we did that, we didn't discuss it too much. This piece from Sean Montague, modified from an earlier work, showcases a battle to take down Marauder Megatron, Thanos style. And this piece from Lindaxi showcases Power Master Optimus and all the allies you could gather, facing down Marauder Megatron once and for all. That's all we know in terms of specific ideas for storylines. Marty says there were no specific plans for characters like Swindle, Meltdown, and the other human villains. They may have appeared, they might not have. Although he does find it somewhat more likely Lockdown might have made his way into the season in some form. Um, Lockdown probably would have come back because he was he was such a, a, a fan favorite character and Andrew Robinson always wrote him. Derek also mentioned once that the Elspark Almanac is wrong and that his sketch of Bludgeon was not designed for inclusion in the fourth season. Uh, I remember seeing a sketch of like Bludgeon. Was he going to be in the show at some point? Uh, ideas? It was, that was probably just more for fun. Uh, we had never talked about Bludgeon. The TF wiki page is wrong. I wonder what normie casual fan wrote. Marty has clarified there really weren't any plans for events past Season 4, had they gotten a fifth green light in some crazy hypothetical scenario. There also weren't real plans for where these characters might end up. They enjoyed a flexible, creative process where ideas came to them as they came. To touch on the largest lingering mystery of Transformers Animated, what is Sari's origin? Derek says they knew it, Marty says they didn't. And when I asked him about this, he was willing to shed more light on the subject. I have an idea in my head of what Sari's origin was, is and was. I don't know that Matt and Derek were completely on board with it. Um, and Hasbro didn't care because Sari wasn't a toy. So ultimately Sari's origin uh, would have been whatever the three of us agreed to. And I, I, we, I don't know that we agreed definitively. Um, or I don't know that I had convinced them. We knew it wouldn't have been related to Primus because Derek hated Primus. Marty denied the theory that it had anything to do with Megatron, but he did say... And I, I will say this, that if you think about it, the answer is obvious. Uh, I, I will say that if, if somebody correctly guesses it, I, I, I would probably say they're, they are correct, or at least that they're wrong. A long time ago, Derek said there were only two possible ways he would consider revealing Sari's origin. What was her actual origin? Why was she on Earth? Why was she created with all um, and I'm only gonna uh, I'm only gonna answer that one of two ways. Either in man, oh man, even either in a, a fiction that Marty Eisenberg has written or on my deathbed. <laughs> <laughs> and now only one remains. I'm, I really, I really hope that we get to see animated come back beyond just having, you know, a references and legacy or homages and, and legacy. Um, I'd love to see animated come back because that was that was something that Derek poured a lot of himself into. And even if it won't be Derek's animated, um, that I don't know. I, I think I think just to have it back out there um, would be nice, you know, just to tell a few more stories. Um, you know, Derek's not here, but Marty's here. You know, I don't know if Matt Youngberg would be excited to, to do something with that again, but, and it would just be nice to go in there every once in a while and tell a story, have an anthology, maybe have the funds to do an animated special. That's, that's, that's me. That's pie in the sky stuff. I want to sincerely thank every artist who was involved in this project. Seeing all of this work come in over the last few months has been incredible. I also want to thank the name brand company for recreating the scrolling gridline effect for me in like 15 minutes. Lastly, I want to thank everyone who was involved in the production of Transformers Animated and the community that's kept the show alive for the last 15 years. It's been an incredible ride. Animated is one show that really feels like it, it belonged to somebody, like someone's art piece. It, it very much feels like it's telling a story and not, not selling toys. Um, and like I like Earthspark. I think Earthspark is 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 fun, but Earthspark feels like it's selling toys. Transformers Prime felt like it was selling toys. 
in a barren, empty wasteland. It was selling toys. But I feel like Animated didn't feel like it was trying to, it wasn't trying to sell me merchandise. I wanted as much merchandise as possible. That's another thing too. That's why I need to keep going because they're toys I want to get in some way, shape or form that we still haven't like seen. I, I need a sorry someday. It's great that he ended up doing Transformers Animated because it feels like that was like the whole thing was he wanted to work up to to touch Transformers at some point. I, I'm so happy he did. Mm-hmm. I am too.